introduce tonight uh, our guest lecturer for tonight is John Moss. John came to Australia after working with Mike Haney a while when his division was acquired by Smith Blind French, um, and they w wanted to sell color TV systems for medical use. Now I don't understand quite why the medical people would want to say that, would want to use that, but. This is well before um, Colour TV existed in Australia as a broadcast thing, and certainly before there was any manufacturing happening in Australia. And John's going to tell us what the background story was behind that and, and uh, the reason why he came to Australia and settled here for the rest of his life. Thank you, John. Hey. Welcome. Right, one or two little inaccuracies in there which I hope to oh, correct uh, la la later on, but um, I mean, Colour TV has not been a large part of my life and I'll be perfectly honest, I think I've had a charmed life which I'll share a little of with you. Now, as, as, a, as a lad growing up in the UK, probably like many, I hadn't got a clue what I wanted to do. Fortunately, my dad had got some sort of vision and he's said, you know, John, I think the right way for you to go is to take an apprenticeship with the Marconi Company. Now, at the time I was living in Sussex, where we'd been evacuated at the beginning of the war, the Marconi Company located in Essex, in Chelmsford, so it meant I was leaving home and basically setting up on my own. Now, I think the Marconi Company were, a comp were probably common with many big companies at the time. They really knew how to have an apprentice scheme. They knew how to look after them to create loyalty. So, there is me, somewhere there. At the time I was told I was actually quite handsome, I sometimes dispute that, but um, that was the intake to the Marconi uh, apprentice system in 1953. Now Marconi had three streams of apprentices, they had the craft ones, people who ended up becoming tradespeople, the students, student stream which became I suppose sort of reasonable engineers and the graduate team, they became the researchers. And I was fortunate to be in the student stream. <coughs> and Marconi's provided a bit like a hotel. It was a very large house which could accommodate about 15 students. They looked after us and provided meals. We had to do laundry and all things like that. But they took us in for the first year while we found our feet and then we had to move out with digs to look after ourselves. I mean, that promoted a, a good sense of loyalty. As I say, I wish many more companies would do that today where I think apprentices have a pretty rough deal. Anyway, Chelmsford at that time was a, a city of about 70 to 80,000 people. It had three main centres of activity. There was the Marconi Company involved in all sorts of electronics. There's the Hoffman Ball Bearing Company. Now Marconi's had about 5,000 people. Hoffman's had about 7,000 people working there. And there was also Crompton Parkinson, who you may recall make alternators and generators and that sort of thing. They had about 3,000 people. And once a year, um, Chelmsford would have a carnival and the Marconi company would say to the apprentices, look, we'll give you a truck and you can do what you like with it to enter the carnival. Oh, uh, by the way, that's the workshop in the uh, place where we uh, were boarded for the first year. So that was uh, one of the carnival things for the year. Uh, and the apprentices put a lot of effort into it and, and again, I mean, that is part of the community spirit that Marconi's built, which I think is so vital. Sometimes it got a little bit warlike, but nonetheless, <laughs> <laughs> very well worth doing. So, during that time as an apprentice, 
uh, which lasted four years. And Marconi's uh, sent us around various departments in the company so that we got an idea of every aspect. Well, we didn't actually visit the paint shop, but we went to transmitters and all that sort of thing. <coughs> and I ended up my apprenticeship working in television development. And uh, that was very good. Interesting things going on there. One of the biggest was the design and manufacture of a large screen TV projector. Now these days we see these massive screens everywhere, don't think anything about it. But in those days, you know, when TV screens were that big and that deep, it was really something quite impressive. And out of that work grew two interesting ideas. The first one was it led to the development of um, uh, flight simulators because with a large screen display you could have a pilot in a, in a simulated cockpit looking at a decent sized picture of the runway and film giving the plane coming into land. So that was the beginning of that and now of course flight simulators far more sophisticated that are used by every airline in the world. And the other thing that uh, developed was more of a military what, what basis. Marconi realised that with a large screen display you could receive radar signals of aircraft, get it on the screen whereby you could have the direction of the aircraft shown that way, speed by the length of the arrow and whether it was friendly or foe by the colour and that basically was it. Now I have no idea how far that went and this is a story that I cannot prove to be true but I strongly believe that it is. The head of the television department was the name of Bill, I won't give his surname away and I mean he was a likeable bloke but everyone said, oh golly, you know, he'd, he'd sell his grandmother if it suited him. So he was a good businessman, very shrewd. And one Monday he did not turn up for work. Unusual. Bill was always there, very dedicated. Tuesday he did not turn up for work. Even more unusual. No news, hadn't signed in sick or anything. Wednesday didn't turn up for work. Thursday he returned and the story was that he had seen the specification for this radar system using the large screen television screen, read it carefully several times and realised nowhere did it have the word secret in it. And so he had taken a plane to Sweden, contacted the government and came back to Marconi with a contract for a couple of systems because he felt that Marconi was far too staid, stick in the mud to do something dynamic like that. Can't prove the story, but it, believe me, it is true. So now, at this time, as a young development engineer, we were working in an army Nissen hut. I don't know if you remember those round buildings, no windows, no light. And I suppose I was relatively happy, but I began to look round at the engineers there that were sort of 40 to 50, peak of their career, and I thought, gee, I. I'm not even certain I'm bright enough to follow in your footsteps and even if I was, is that really what I want to do? And I came to the conclusion, <laughs> no I bloody didn't. So I approached Marconi who had another division called Television Demonstration Unit and that's where they had a crew of blokes who would demonstrate their various television products 
And that is where I came into contact with colour television. Now, Marconi's had provided to the medical company Smithline and French Laboratories a complete colour TV mobile unit with large screen TV projection and they provided it to the medical profession as a service. And you might think, well golly, that's mighty generous of them. Well, yes it was. But remember, what they were getting out of it was, as they went round the country, and this was in the UK, to all the major seminars, operational specialities and things like that, inviting hundreds of doctors to watch the procedures, Smithline and French were getting to know the top brass of the medical profession. And that was the trade-off. The medical profession got a free teaching service. Smithline and French got to know the top brass of the medical profession. So the cameras were in the operating feeds, were they? Yes, so they were. Yes, they were indeed. We will come to that. How soon? Huge. Well, OK, we, we will leap forward to the cameras so you can, so you can get some idea. There's two views of the vehicle. Now that is, <laughs> now, I mean, you, you, you look at that and they, those things took two men to lift up onto the gantry. And I mean, it is, Sorry, what year is it? oh, this, this would be in the uh, late 50s, 60s. You know, this is now higher quality than what that was. And had you said to me at that time, you know, there'll come a time when, you'll have a camera better than that in your pocket. I would have laughed in your face. But it has happened. So, where, where was I up to? That's right, yes. That continued for about three years. Now, of course, the advertising department at Smith, Iron and French obviously wanted to do a lot more than just have medical things, and they eventually dis persuaded the company that They'd had enough of this jolly teaching business. They wanted to return to normal advertising. What are you going to do with this colour TV unit? So oh, Smith, Iron and French UK said, hmm, well, we've got the Aussies down there. I wonder if we could flog it to them. So that is, in fact, what happened. I received a uh, phone call one morning from a Mr Manley Cooper saying uh, we wish to invite you to a business lunch, a business breakfast in London. Can you attend? So I said yes. Got up there nine o'clock in the morning at this breakfast. He said, uh, well, look, John, we've got this position, someone to run the mobile colour TV in Australia. If you can find two engineers to go with you, you can have the job. So, I mean, that was a dilemma. I mean, remember what it was like in those days. Australia was far away. Everyone said, oh, golly, don't do that, John. They have kangaroos in the streets and <laughs> <laughs> things like that. A lot of negative comments. But I figured, you know, look, John, you can go for two years. If you don't like it, you can come back. And I really think I might like it. So I managed to find two people to come with me and the vehicles were transported to Australia. So we arrived in 1965, spent the first month in Perth, uh, at various Perth hospitals, and then they travelled overland to the eastern coast, where we did the, you know, the capital cities of Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, a few other smaller ones, and that continued very happily for three years and I can remember being called into uh, talks with higher management saying you know John uh, this is going on for a long time what updates would you like to have for the equipment so we did long-term 10-year plans and all that sort of thing but 
it did not work out that way. And I should point out that that was a time when large companies were diversifying and Smithline and French Laboratories decided in their wisdom that they needed to take on an electronics division. So they bought an American company called Carbon, Corbin Farnsworth, renamed it Smithline Instruments, and at the same time as they were doing that, they were saying to the uh, TV crew, sorry fellas, uh, good days have come to an end, we're going to get rid of you. And that was a bit hard, but fortunately, Someone at Smith Line and French thought, well, golly, we've got this mobsy character there, seems to be some sort of engineer, might know a bit about television. I wonder if he knows anything about medical instruments. So they said, would you like the job? What would you do? I mean, quite obvious. I didn't know anything about it, but it was <laughs> continuous employment, and they said they'll do some training. So they shot me off to uh, Palo Alto where Corbin Farnsworth gave me some not very useful training with their equipment and I then returned to Sydney, colour TV days behind me and began installing coronary care and medical care equipment around, the, around Australia. But I strayed a little bit and not given you sufficient detail about the, um, the colour TV. Now there's one picture of the camera. That's another picture of one ready set up in the operating theatre. Um, and, and I'm amazed at the uh, tolerance of the medical profession with all this equipment going on. Uh, I mean, it really was intrusive, but they seem to manage it very well. Now I mentioned the... Um, Those are lighting up, four big lights. Yeah, they're, they're just the lights, yes. Yeah. Now I mentioned the um, large screen projector. Here is a picture, it's not, it's not the best picture I could produce, but you can see between the two fellows there, uh, w one of the projection heads. They work with three uh, high intensity cathode ray tubes, red, blue and green, which you align them on the screen, line them up, and then you've got good colour. And the big box in the middle there is the final power supply, which um, went from the initial power supply of 2 kV, and that one gave you the final voltage of 50 kV, which the tubes needed to operate. So you know, we were operating with <laughs> pretty lethal equipment, but it was all pretty good fun. Now, uh, finally, uh, with the uh, colour TV, when it came to Australia, the Aussies looked at the or original design and thought, well, we really don't like that, and they decked it out in the new colours, which I thought was really very much better. So, that basically is the story of colour TV uh, as viewed by John Mobbs and his part in it. But it, we did come to Australia before any commercial TV was done. We weren't selling anything. It was just a service for the medical profession. Any questions? Does anyone know what year it was that we started broadcasting colour TV in Australia? 75, I think. Yeah. So, it was, yeah. so it was probably a uh, half a dozen years or more? Yes, it was. It was 60, 60, 65 we brought it out, yes. So do you know if any of those engineers went on to work in the TV industry here in Australia? Uh, I think some did, yes. Yeah. Yep. So they have, they have the continuity, the continuous continuation of that story. Well, it's interesting. And we, we, when they finally decided to get rid of it, the uh, cameras ended up at the Powerhouse Museum and were an item on display there. I, I don't think it's still there, but it was for several years. Hmm. Wonderful some storage there. Were the, were the cameras noisy in the operating theatre? No, 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 perfectly quiet. Oh, yep. the, the amount of light they needed, the, you know, the, um, the um, not Plumbicon, Orthicon 
type tubes, the camera tubes weren't. Oh yes, yes, they did, they did require a lot of light, and yeah, I mean, sensitive, yeah. And I remember in one one operation which was on uh, so, something to do with the patient's hand here, uh, and and the light was so intense that uh, we we burnt the skin. <laughs> <laughs> And the first thing the doctor said was, he did sign the consent form, didn't he? <laughs> uh, so none of this was recorded, so you just filmed operations. Wow. Yeah, yes, I mean, the Ampex recorders didn't come in until well yeah, after so this. Recorders, they were just no. transmitted live in yes. another room yes. where they had other, other trainee doctors or whatever just, just watching, watching TV. Yes, yeah, I mean, it's like... Okay. Yeah. Did they watch it in that truck? Um, did they, like, where did they watch it? Uh, oh, that, that, that vehicle there is just the tender vehicle. That's the one that carried the, uh, the cameras, the large screen projector, all the cables. I mean, we, we had a 100 amp uh, three-phase cable to drive the vehicle, uh, <laughs> yeah. to drive the whole thing. One, one phase went to drive the control vehicle, and the other two phases were for the lighting in the studio. Camera control units and all that kind of stuff. I know in those days they were they, they were quite big. So was, was all that was all that in the in the in the van? So yes, that was in the van. In the front of the van, just behind the driver's seat, yeah. uh, were, were were three uh, large or oh, golly racks that 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 size colour TVs and. Every time we arrived on site, first of all, you have to degauss them because the magnetic field had changed, and then you had to lift them from just seating to up at the correct angle for the operator to work it. So it's really quite complicated. And then converting them all on the screen. Big pardon? Converting the colours all on the screen. Converting the three colours together on the screen. Uh, oh, it's a, a, a standard uh, colour TV tube with, uh, you know, the, the, the three rows of dots. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So your, your, your van, besides transporting all the stuff, it was the, it was like the studio, the camera control unit. Yes, um, yeah. The yep. cameras fed into the van. Um, the panel operator sat behind the screens. Yeah. Did, did the audio and video mixing. Whatever. I mean, we, we had a, a, a couple of people... Um, uh, monitoring the cameras, then we had a, a, an overall producer and a sound man. Yep. Yeah. So that, that created the, the crew. M my task normally in all of this was in, in the audience making sure the color uh, large screen projector was working properly because you know that was what the audience was seeing. So I figured that was the most important bit that I could do. Yes, it. Um, oh, it was. Yes. Yeah, like um, Channel Seven went Marconi yep. color in '75. I was there in '76 at Channel Seven, and yep. they had three, two or three big outside broadcast fans, and they're very similar. You yep. Plug everything around in it. Um, you have a full, full car control studio in the van, audio, video, the whole lot. Yeah. Plug the cameras in the back, and then. Uh, it'd go off, uh, and my, mainly outside broadcasting, sport broadcasting. Yeah. So uh, yeah, with Rex, Rex Mossop and the others, and yeah, and off, and then um, into the next van and up the stick into a microwave. Yeah. And off to, off to a link, and then back to the studio. Yeah. So yeah, virtually the, an early version of this similar practice. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of kit in those vans yep. to, to make it happen. A lot of heavy kit. After you crossed from Perth to the East Coast, <laughs> sorry. You, after you crossed Australia from Perth to the East Coast, yeah. Did everything still work? <laughs> it, was it was a dirt road. <laughs> yes, it did. Yep, yep. Okay. It was pretty solid. So, and you guys, the three of you in the van. You no, we we, we travel separately. We. Oh. We're a bit snobby. But we're oh, right, <laughs> we, 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 got, um, we, we got drivers for the vehicles, but, uh, but I would insist that one of the technical crew 
w would be with the vehicles just in case of you know major disaster somewhere along the line. Uh, so, the whole crew wouldn't have a chance of that. so how many days a week did you actually? You know, it must oh, it take varied. a quite long time it, to set the thing up. So if you were filming an operation, you know, how... how I mean, at a normal hospital, you'd set up in a day. Mm -hmm. And then you might be two or three days, uh, depending on the, the, the length of the uh, conference or whatever it is you're covering. So it might have been three days or five days. Then you, you know, spend a, a, a day or so just making sure everything's working properly, ready for the next one. And you had no tapes and no recording devices? No, no. They, they just weren't invented at that time. No, well, I mean, because NASA did early in the late 60s, but that was a few years for the wrong Yeah. I mean, as I said, when, uh, when I finished the TV and became uh, a, a medical instruments person, um, Corbin Farnsworth, who were, you know, at that time world leaders in medical technology, they were the first people to manage to make a delayed signal of uh, heart waveforms and things. And they do that by having continuous tape loops. Yeah, you could have tape one tape minute, tape. five minutes or half hour yeah. tape loops and you, you'd look at current or past, you know. Uh, I mean, th th things have just changed so much, it's, well, it's difficult. <laughs> Robert Fripp was using tape loops on his guitar in, mm. in 68, 69. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he'd, be, Crimson. he'd be following along with his own, with his own uh, signal to, yeah. delayed by a few seconds. Oh. A trick they called Trippatronics. Oh, right, yep. <laughs> and yeah, the off, uh, SK and F, were you based at SK and F in French's Forest? Mm. Yep. Oh, yeah, okay, Rodbrook Road, French's Forest. Yep, that's yeah, it. Okay. Yeah, which is now going to be a Bunnings, yeah. Oh, yeah, really? uh, yeah. S, 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 K and F in French's Forest, the father-in-law and the mother-in-law both worked there for 25 odd years. Yeah. And, it's only been uh, demolished in the last year or so. Yeah, it was, a man, it was manufacturing, pharmaceutical manufacturing. And they, uh, the majority of the stuff they did there, the specialist stuff, was, uh, was veterinary. Uh, and then a lot of well, I don't know about the majority. Stuff. I mean, but, uh, yeah, I, 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 I kind of recognise the site. And when, you mean when, what yeah. your family did there was veterinary? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they made a lot of veterinary drugs, and uh, mm -hmm. and yeah, they, uh, they, they did make a, 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 a lot of, a lot of stuff. But they, they were big on that side too. But the previous picture of the colour van, the, um, the, the late model van there, and you see the overhead power lines, and said. Oh, that looks like French's forest. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I kind of recognised the car park. So you were based there. And but I mean, when I, when I joined them in 65, I think um, Fitlan and French were sort of in, in the first three of, you know, uh, pharmaceuticals. They, they, they'd got pots of money. They really had. Yep. Are they still going? Well, they, they were taken over by, um, uh, uh, yeah, Klein. Um, they're now part of the Beecham Group, I think you'll find. Beecham, uh, Beecham got them yep. um, a while back, and then um, somebody else is in it now. But, um, yeah, yeah, take a good company and destroy it. Yeah. Yep. Well, I mean, it's very sad. I mean, Marconi's is now completely gone. They, they were another country that... Uh, company that was raped. It, 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 it's, it's so sad because it was a wonderful company. It really was. They, were, they went very big in colour. You've got uh, Marconi in the UK because Channel Seven went completely Marconi. Yeah. Uh, Channel Nine went um, uh, Fernsay, German stuff. Yep. Channel Two went Philips. Um, so Marconi was. Very big and very prominent. Um, oh, it was, yeah. In those days, and they must have really, really got into colour. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and Pi, Pi was a big um, competitor at the time. And I, I remember uh, one, one time when um, we, we'd lost a bid for um, a whole set of new uh, cameras, and the head of TV assembled us all together and said, you know, look, uh, don't be too depressed. You have to realise that sometimes it's not in the company's best interest to win. You know, so they bid low, 
pie got it and they had to you know really shave prices to get it yeah. and, and you know the strategy and you you ever keep ever kept contact with old when you when you came to SKF and instrument side with with your Marconi mates back home and what what whatever whatever happened to the system and the boys and the apprentices and others you started out with and how uh, 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 only only a few and um, uh, one of the chaps in uh, uh, television demonstration unit, uh, Ron Huntsman, he developed an interest in radios and uh, he ended up with his wife living in uh, Cambridge, uh, a decent sized garden with a large shed at the bottom and in there he must have had about 20 or 30 uh, carefully selected radios of various types, um, all, you know, beautifully repaired, working properly, switch everyone on, tune it, uh, amazing. Uh, and I thought, you know, I don't think I've got such a single burning desire, but he had, and it's still there. How long did you stick in the medical instruments game, literally? Um, How long did you stay in medical instruments, literally? Saw it oh golly, well that, of it. <laughs> that's all a little bit complicated. Um, Smith, uh, uh, Smith, Line and French, after diversifying, after about three years, I think they realised, you know, we know how to run a drugs company, but really we're not very good at running an electronics company. So who can we offload this to? So they sold it to an American company called Electronic Associates Incorporated, who were very big on analog computers. Now, they had an office and staff and everything in Sydney. So I was sort of handed over to Electronic Associates Sydney, along with about $250,000 worth of medical equipment <laughs> dumped on the doorstep. And I don't think EAI really knew what to do with me for a while. <laughs> what was but, the uh, impression about the um, Second World War? Because Marconi was uh, very big producing transmitters and receivers for the Lancaster bomber and all that. What was the, when you joined the company, was there some history of that? Or, uh, oh, golly, I don't, I don't remember that. I mean, I do know that uh, what, what with uh, Marconi, Hoffmans and Cronsons, you know, Chelmsford was, was a good target for, uh, for the Germans and they put a lot of effort into bombing the place. But, uh, you know, I didn't move there till 1950, um, 53, uh, and the war had ended, you know, quite some time before. So I, I think history had really been... It, it, uh, moved on is, is a current phrase, yeah. <laughs> so any, anyway, I was saying that um, I was handed over to um, yeah. Electronic Associates and they really didn't know what to do with me. But one thing they did have, now Electronic Associates made big analog computers and they were used by the aero industry, the chemical industry, the atomic industry and obviously they had smaller ones for sort of training purposes and in Australia the, the boss there Boris Slinsky, a very shrewd fellow said you know look I, I think we could make an even smaller one which would be of value to universities and he de designed this uh, small scale analogue computer and it sold gangbusters all around the world. I don't know quite what happened, but he suddenly vanished because of a supposed conflict of interests. So there was EAI Australia suddenly without a boss. So EAI USA sent the big man flying over, working out what to do. 
and he decided that, well, yes, this company definitely needs an American manager. <laughs> we don't know what we're going to do about that just yet, but in the moment, what we're going to do is we're going to make the, uh, 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 the accountant, he'll be responsible for money, uh, we'll make Mobsy um, accountable for uh, manufacturing, and we'll make Peter Greenhow uh, ac accountable for sales. So suddenly, I'd got a position. I knew what I had to do. <laughs> and, and I stayed there for uh, just about 10 years, and very satisfying. And we made these analog computers, and we sold them all over the place until the digital computer came along. And of course, initially, not much interest, but all of a sudden, like every change, it suddenly swept and sales dropped like a bomb. Um, can, you, can you remember any model numbers or descriptions of analog computers so I can find data about them? What, what were they called? Well, they were called analog computers. Yeah, but they must have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the EAI 680 was, was one of their yeah, big ones. Um, uh, we had the uh, EAI 2000 in Australia. Um, Which was the university one? Uh, uh, 2000, and uh, I can't remember the name of the before we made the 2000. I think it was just uh, uh, our little analog computer. <laughs> but uh, it had interesting uses. I mean, they, they used it in the, in the beer growing industry, in the chicken feed industry. They, they had a lot of uses. Oh. Mm. oh, yeah, I mean, like in the early 80s, Loyang, we had the controls for Loyang, and that, that was mm. still analog. That's the last Power big, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's a last big analog computer that we saw, but this is about 82, 83, and this is just racks and racks of analog computers for the border. Oh, yeah. So, so, so they were still around, huh? yeah, even in the early 80s. Yeah. Great. There you go, it's one of the museums. Yeah, I think they have an analog museum here. Yeah. Analog museum, dog. It's in the museum. There's a picture of one. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very good. Yeah. That's good. That's why I want the model numbers so I can go to search for it because someone's got to have them in a museum somewhere. Probably want a caveat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, all good. Excellent. Well, we've got more questions? I don't know about you, but I thought, I thought that was fascinating because I didn't know that quality of people before the 1970s mm -hmm. in Australia. To know that it was here in the early 60s, mm -hmm. being driven around the country, being used to throwing yeah. some of our doctors. I mean, my father probably washed up roaches on some of those things. Yeah. So I thought that was um, something that should be put on tape yeah. and recorded. Yeah. Mementos from people that are still... Yeah, they still have those stories in those days. Yeah. So thank you so much, John. You're very welcome. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we're transmitting colour.